Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas. Our ongoing study in Thessalonians of AD 51. Today we actually enter into 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at uh, chapter 1, 1 through 10. And Paul is not going to really shift in his uh, perspective. He's still going to be looking toward the, uh, the parousia, second advent, returning advent of Christ. But now he's going to uh, change his focus, and he's going to focus on Isaiah's Day of the Lord. Let's begin with uh, verses 1 and 2 on the left. And again, uh, Paul starts the letter with uh, the three who are sending the letter, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of Thessalonica, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the use of the ecclesia here brings attention to the Thessalonians that they are God's covenant people. And the concept of God as the father of believers is a distinctive aspect of Paul's teaching and Paul's theology. By stating that God is our father gives the letter um, a sense of warmth and a unity between Paul and the Thessalonian church. Now in verse 2, he goes on with the blessing. He says, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a double reference to God and Christ here, and that emphasizes the divinity that both share in Paul's theology. Already early on, Paul possesses a very high Christology. His Christology is a very high Christology. And additionally, we need to understand that uh, as far as Paul is concerned, this acknowledgement of deity is something that Thessalonians had already been taught while he ministered there for three weeks. But it is significant because it represents a shift in Paul's thought from strict Judaic monotheism to uh, an evolving trinity. He, he's, it hasn't arrived as yet. He doesn't really have a consciousness of the doctrine of the trinity fully developed. But it is emerging as he... Uh, transitions to this state of uh, proclaiming the Father and the Son as co-equal in their deity. From here, let's move on to verses 3 and 4 in the second block. And Paul says that uh, he and Silas and Timothy out to thank God always. They feel obligated to thank God always concerning the brothers in Thessalonica. And he says, because of their increasing, always on the increase, hyper-spiritual growth. He uses uh, the concept of huper auzano, and huper auzano means a tremendously quick-growing, hyper-spiritual growth, which is always increasing, always growing. So they're a very, very dynamic church at Thessalonica. And he says it's because, because of your growing faith and your growing abounding in the agape self-giving of the gospel. And he says this is a, something that we need to uh, commend and be thankful for, for each individual person at Thessalonica and the fact that you uh, manifest this toward one another. So Paul is also emphasizing the fact that they have a strong koinonia fellowship, one toward another. And giving thanks was uh, very common in any Christian liturgy. And for Paul, God the Father had been responsible for the Thessalonians' spiritual growth. Paul recognizes the objective obligation to be thankful because of this uh, hyper-spiritual growth. And so it is a, a growth which is of a, a continuous nature. If we move on to verse 4, Paul continues, continues and he says, Therefore we ourselves, the three of us, myself, Silas, and Timothy, we boast and we glory in you. We boast and glory in the church at Thessalonica because of your endurance, 
because of your uh, hupo meno, enduring and standing firm. Again, Paul likes to use that uh, hyper prefix, but uh, he says your hupo meno, your standing firm in the gospel, is reason for us to boast of your fellowship at Thessalonica. Because this is a growth and a uh, endurance in the midst of persecution, in the midst of diagmas, in the midst of diagmas persecution. And Paul says that they uh, they do testify to the other churches throughout Judea of this uh, growth of the Thessalonica church. So for Paul, it's important to emphasize the fact that they uh, practice hupomeno endurance and that they do this in the midst of a diagmois persecution. So he says, you are practicing spiritual growth as a hupomeno standing firm and in the midst of diagmos persecution. So we will boast of this blessing that you have uh, reached this kind of growth, this kind of dedication. But Paul later, when he gets to uh, chapter 2, 13 through 14, he will emphasize the fact that he considers the spiritual growth of the church in Thessalonica to be a direct evidence of God's election and growth through election. For Paul, faith is an important piece of armor for the coming parousia, returning advent of Christ. And Paul had already, in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, had already had spoken of his crown of boasting in the church at Thessalonica. Now Paul, uh, his concepts for suffering in his theology included the diagmas that he says that these Thessalonian members are going through. That is strictly religious persecution, which uh, thalipsis can be any kind of difficulty, but he is specifically mentioning diagmas, spiritual persecution, persecution, religious persecution, persecuted for the cause of Christ. From here, let's move on to uh, verse 5. And Paul uh, gives them an exhortation saying that this endurance of yours, this hupomeno, is a token of righteous judgment. It is a showing forth like a sign of divine judgment. And it's the judgment of God unto your worthiness as believers. You are deemed worthy because you are hupomeno, firmly standing for Christ in the midst of persecution. So you are worthy concerning God's kingdom. And he says this is a very definitely an en dinuo. He says this is an evidence of proof that you actually have been uh, elected by God the Father through Jesus Christ. Therefore, you are worthy. This is the worthy sign of acceptance that you are truly children of the kingdom of God, truly aligned with the ministry of Jesus Christ. So in this first uh, opening salutation, we have tremendous emphasis by Paul on the fact that uh, the Members of the Thessalonian church are hupomeno standing firm. They are hupomeno enduring their bearing of the cross in the midst of persecution, in the midst of hagiagmas persecution, diagmas persecution. Get my word right there. And so for Paul, this is extremely important. For Paul, this becomes extremely important because he says you become an en di nuo sign of the presence of Jesus Christ and the presence of God's kingdom because you are faithful and enduring in the midst of the I did it again here where we go diagmas persecution okay in the midst of diagmas persecution you are standing firm hupomeno enduring 
your bearing of the cross in the midst of diagmas persecution. It's an extremely important point on Paul's part, and it's going to make more sense to us now when we look at verses 6 through 10, because now he's going to say, because you are enduring in the midst of persecution, that not only should you look toward the parousia of the returning advent of Christ as a moment of grace and fulfillment for yourselves within the new covenant, but also you should understand it as the Hemera to Kiryu, the Hemera to Kiryu, the day of the Lord. So now Paul wants to emphasize Isaiah's day of the Lord. He wants to take the same point of view toward the parousia, returning advent of Christ, but he wants to focus on what will be the uh, judgment of Christ in this return, which is uh, Isaiah's day of the Lord. So then the shift of focus, let's take a look at verses 6 and 7 on the right. And Paul goes on to say, uh, this is a righteous thing with God that you are enduring in the midst of persecution. And therefore, he will repay those who are oppressing you. He will repay, he will uh, anti-apodidomai, anti-apodidomai, he will repay those who trouble you, those who persecute you, he will repay in his judgment. And in Paul's theology, God's judgment is always his act of justice. It's always an act of justice. Paul's intention here is to supply the Thessalonians with eschatological perspective, and under eschatological perspective, they can understand the day of the Lord as the day when things will be set right, including the setting right of judgment. And he says specifically in verse 7, and to you who are being persecuted, and he uses the participle here to mean to say that, and to you who are being continually persecuted by these uh, elders of the synagogue and this uh, Jewish hierarchy, he says, take relief in the fact that uh, you will be given relief in the returning parousia. And here he uses the apocalypse. He says, you will receive relief in the apocalypse of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will receive relief in the returning parousia advent, which will be an apocalypse disclosure of the glory of Christ. So we have to key in on these uh, distinctions that distinctions in Paul's theology. He will speak of the parousia, of the returning advent of Christ. But returning parousia also means apocalypse. It also means the uh, full disclosure of the glory of Jesus Christ. And it will come, it will be an apocalypse that will come from heaven with powerful angels, the dunamis power as a power of potentiality that angels possess. And uh, so he does point to divine reward here in this uh, repayment. It will be judgment, but it will also be a reward and relief. Paul transitions to identifying the parousia as Christ's apocalyptic revelation. Their hope rests in the promise that Christ will be revealed from heaven fully in his doxa glory and in his divine authority. So this returning parousia will be judgment. This returning parousia will be relief. And this returning parousia will fully disclose the doxa glory of Jesus Christ. A full disclosure will take place on the day of parousia returning advent. Now if you look at verses 8 and 9, to continue on with this day of the Lord emphasis, Paul gets specific and he says that Christ will come like a flaming fire and literally, literally in a very literal way that means he will come like lightning, like a flash of lightning. And he will inflict vengeance on those not knowing God 
He will inflict judicial punishment on those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel, who are not spiritually listening, hupakuo, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul specifically adopts the concept of fire of judgment, which was present in much of Jewish literature, where the angels are the executors of judicial power, where the Lord comes to rebuke with flames, as in Isaiah 66. In Isaiah 66, we have the prophetic announcements of the Lord coming in a rebuke with flames. And the reason is given also in Isaiah 66, where God says, When I called, none did answer. Paul takes us up. Those who do not answer to the closest call of Jesus Christ are going to suffer the judgment of the Lord at the day of the parousia. And that judgment means being shut out from God's presence. Paul is referencing Isaiah 2.10 and 2.19 here. He is inferring that this is a judgment against idolatry. He equates it with idolatry. But it will be a separation from Christ's presence to those who are not called, to the non-elect, to the persecutors. They will suffer a judgment of separation from the presence of Christ. So we've got a little uh, quote here from Green. He says that from Christ's presence, everlasting destruction will come forth. The persecutors will suffer the penalty of destruction, the judgment of eternal destruction out of the presence of the Lord, says Paul. It says, uh, and the glory of his power, the force of his glory, is the majesty of power as the measure of judgment. So it's the majesty of doxa glory in Jesus Christ, which constitutes judgment. It is the measure of judgment. And it's a measure of doxa, full doxa glory. So Paul speaks of a returning parousia advent of Jesus Christ. He speaks of the apocalyptic full disclosure of the doxa glory of Jesus Christ. And that full disclosure of the doxa glory of Jesus Christ will reward believers and it will punish persecutors. The same doxa glory will have a twofold effect. So the apocalypse will be the returning parousia advent of Jesus Christ. The apocalypse will be full disclosure of the glory of Jesus Christ. And the full disclosure of the glory of Jesus Christ will have a twofold significance because it will reward and it will rebuke. It will reward with grace. It will rebuke with the rebuke of flames, rebuke of fire. So we have the parousia, returning advent of Christ, transitioning to the apocalyptic return of Christ, and the uh, day of the Lord judgment of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at uh, verse 10 at the bottom right. Now in verse 10, we see that uh, Christ shall come to be glorified in all of his saints. He will be incarnately glorified in the believers. And the believers will marvel at this full disclosure of glory. They will wonder at the full disclosure of glory. And Paul says, this will come to pass because our testimony to you in Thessalonica was believed. Paul says, take up the eschatological perspective because you did believe our testimony. You did believe the euangelion, good news of Jesus Christ. You believed the gospel and you practice that belief. I've had a favorable, favorable report. You are growing in faith. Therefore, the double 
consequence of the dis full disclosure of Jesus Christ and his glory shall come to, fa come to pass on your behalf. It will be a full disclosure of glory that creates reward and a full disclosure of glory that creates the day of the Lord judgment. So these opening ten verses give us great truth here for uh, the direction of the second letter to the Thessalonians. It is most assuredly first a praise, a, a salutation that says that we celebrate the fact that you are growing in faith and growing in agape self-giving in the midst of persecution. And then he goes on to say in the next part of this opening 10 verses that because of your growth in faith, the eschatological perspective will include reward on your part from the full disclosure of Jesus Christ, his apocalypse, which means full disclosure, and will also mean the apocalypse of the day of the Lord coming in judgment. So first, we praise you and we thank God for your growth in spiritual ministry and understanding. Additionally, I proclaim to you the promise that the full disclosure of Jesus Christ in the Apocalypse, which he calls the parousia of the Apocalypse here, will be reward for you, relief for you, and the day of the Lord judgment for the persecutors. And we will pick up uh, next time. Uh, this is Lesson 12. We'll pick up at Lesson 13 next time.